Hey, good day, everyone. We will get started now and make sure that we are recording this for our socials, which we usually do for our very successful suite of webinars that we've had over 2023. My name is Omar Mohammed. I'm the Chief Executive Officer at the Kroppa Foundation. And the foundation is the parent organization for the Caribou Environmental News Network, uh, under which we've been able to bring these fantastic webinars to life over the past year. And of course, the webinars are a combination of live webinars that you all will be participating in today, but also they gain you know, quite a lot of traction when we post uh, the webinars in the entirety or in sections um, across social media where they go on to kind of have life, a life of their own. So as this is the final webinar for the year, I just wanted to reiterate some of the successes of Caribou Environmental News Network that's led uh, to very great uh, success by Tyrell Gittins, who is the coordinator of the network itself and who you'll hear from later on today to wrap things up. So Caribou Environmental News Network initially started right here in Trinidad and Tobago. And over the last year, 2023, Caribou has been able to publish 62 stories, which are a combination of original stories from Guyana, Belize, Trinidad and Tobago, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Antigua and Barbados, Barbados and Suriname, as well as origin, 15 original stories published under our new youth journalism project. We also publish partnership stories with Climate Tracker under their citizen journalism fellowships. And we've also invited contributions from other agencies and institutions, such as the Environment, the Institute for Marine Affairs here in Trinidad and Tobago, Environment Tobago, Climate Tracker, and so on. We've been able to expand, as we said, throughout the Caribbean over 2023. And we've also done so by partnering with Global Voices, which is an international citizen journalism platform, which has then been able to take those stories from our civil society groups and other citizen journalists from across the Caribbean out to its global. Uh, we've also been able to publish uh, to launch our successful webinar series, of, of which this is the last of 2023. We've been able to have free state of the environment webinars and free climate breakdown webinars. Um, and of course, those touch on different things. The climate breakdown really focuses on the issues around climate change within the Caribbean and the state of environment looks at, you know, diverse environment and conservation focused topics that are of importance to the Caribbean itself. So of course, at its heart, the Caribbean Environmental News Network is meant to be that platform in which we bring stories from the ground up in relation to how the people in the Caribbean are dealing with environmental change, um, including climate change. And of course, to amplify the voices of those who generally may not find it an easy time um, to get their stories heard. So today, again, is our last uh, State of Environment webinar where we focus on lessons learned uh, from across the Americas in relation to the proliferation of extreme weather events and other natural disasters um, that unfortunately have plagued the region. Um, so before I hand it over to our incredible moderator, just some housekeeping rules. Um, or notes actually. Some of you all may be signing in as Tyrell Gittens. We had a slight uh, snafu with the link. So if you realize that your name is in fact not Tyrell Gittens, which I believe might be for most of you all, mm -hmm. if you go to participants at the bottom of your Zoom and you click it, you'll see the list of names on your right. Uh, you will probably have to go to your name, which was usually at the top of that participant list. So if you see a Tyrell Gittins at the top, um, there will be three buttons next to it that will come up when you when you put your um, 
cursor, your arrow over it, and you have an option to rename. If that isn't working, uh, you can also message one of the Cropper Foundation team. You should see our logos in our names when you click participant. And just let us know in a, in a message the name that you want us to change it um, to for, um, for you for the purposes of the webinar. Um, if it's if you're fine and you're just here to, to observe, you don't need to change it, but you know, it's always nice to represent ourselves. Um, also, please keep your mics muted for the duration of the webinar, just to reduce any sort of extra noise and, uh, you know, reduce any disturbance to the panelists as well as your fellow attendees. Um, as well, you know, for the Q&A section, you'll be free to put your cameras on, but during the panel uh, session itself, uh, please keep them off so we can focus on um, our great collection of panelists who have agreed to be here with us today. So I'm going to hand it over to Carly Chanona, who is a Belizean national, who is, has been a regular and successful contributor to Caribou Environmental News Network, as well as a multitude of other publications and platforms around environment, but also travel journalism. So Carly is one of our great success stories, and we're extremely proud that she's agreed and able to moderate uh, this last webinar of 2023. So, Carly, I'm handing it over to you. Thanks, Omar. And thanks, of course, to all the staff here um, of the Cropper Foundation. I think it's just a testament of how important a platform like this is, especially for the Caribbean. So I'm very happy to be a part of this news network. Um, and I also wanted to say thanks for having me as a moderator. Um, I'm excited to hear some of the stories um, successes and lessons that we can apply going forward um, in our own sort of niches um, and just so you know host this discussion together so I wanted to welcome everyone to today's webinar it's a part of the climate breakdown series which originally began in April of this year um, that's also alongside the state of the environment series so um, this again it's a platform for stakeholders and experts to just open a discussion, cross share, and ultimately build our capacity as a region. Um, Omar kind of gave a brief introduction, but again, my name is Carly Chanona. I am a contributing voice to the Caribou News Network, um, and I'm a journalist based here in Belize. So, natural disasters, unfortunately, are not any stranger to us here. Um, I'm actually living in a flood prone area. I've lived through many hurricanes in my life. So, I think it's going to be a very insightful and um, great discussion that we'll have today. So, of course, small island states are disproportionately affected by extreme weather events. And as climate change impacts intensify, so do the frequency and severity of natural disasters. So we're going to be hearing from three experts across the Americas. And I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce them today. Um, Omar mentioned that we'll have a Q&A at the end of this discussion to kind of just share any feedback, questions, maybe, you know, anything that you may want to add to the conversation. You can also add it to the chat and we can get to it at the end. But if you'd just like to hold on to those questions until we have all three presentations today. So um, let me go ahead. Do I just choose each presenter? Um, I think I will choose Ursula first. So Ursula Tovia Sanchez is a biologist and environmental activist from San Cristobal de las Casas, Chiapas, Mexico. That's our neighbor to the north here in Belize. Over the years, Ursula has participated in the design of public policies on both an international and national level. She's also been involved in socio-environmental projects on climate change, biodiversity, traditional knowledge, sustainable development, gender, and youth. Ursula is currently a manager under Mexico's Operation Blessings Initiative, which works on food security and entrepreneurial projects in underserved communities. She is also co-director of Eco Makshai AC, which is an NGO focused on gender and biodiversity processes. As an activist, she has been a policy advocacy coordinator at the Global Youth Biodiversity Network Mexico chapter, and she's also a member of the Women Caucus of the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. 
Ursula is also a co-founder of the Water and Territory Network of the Jovel Valley Watershed. So I'll pass it over to Ursula. Um, you'll also may hear from her um, translator. So if anything, um, he'll be stepping in as well. So Ursula. Hi, thank you, Carol. Um, it's a pleasure to able to be present in this, this web, webinar and share a little bit about the experience I had supporting the impacts that Huracan Notice had in Mexico. Um, so you want to just go ahead and maybe preload your presentation. Um, again, we'll just ask everyone to remain muted and have their videos off if anyone else joins. Okay, thank so, you. The floor is yours. Um, <laughs> thank you. As context, uh, Huracan Notis has been one of the strongest storms in the historical records on the Pacific Ocean coast of Mexico. It went from a tropical storm to a category five hurricane in 12 uh, hours. Its span was uh, 185 kilometers per hour. Howard, um, this hurricane reached Acapulco and Coyuca Guerrero on October uh, 12, uh, 25 at, of this year. It um, destroyed power lines, uprooted trees, and unleashed, unleashed uh, torrential floods and landslides. Um, this caused loss of life and property. Um, there, there are still no official numbers, but so far an estimated uh, of for night, 49 people uh, are dead and, and 56 are missing. Um, in addition to severe damage to approx 80% um, of the hotels in the coastal area of Acapulco and damage to more than 200,000 homes. All this storm cause, caused damage to the rainforest. Um, so it took two weeks to fix the telephone lines and the power supply in the near and the weather distribution system are still be, be, being reestablished. Um, from two the from two to three days, humanitarian aid arrived from different organizations to distribute food supply, um, supply weather, set up community kitchen, uh, collect the rice, um, the beers, and medical attention, uh, among other action to help the people. Um, the government, uh, besides being part of the immediate attention, uh, has also distributed uh, appliances and beds for the families that were affected and made uh, small flyers where they informed about why the hurricane happened and, and recommendation to choose the necessary materials to rebuild the house in this uh, safer way. Um, so in the organization where I work, Operation Blessing at an international level, we have a disaster pillar that has the objective of immediate attention to disaster of this intensity 
Uh, so a special team traveled, traveled uh, to Acapulco and Coyuca to attend the first month. Uh, after that, uh, leader by leader Operation Blessing Mexico, we come to support in different areas, especially weather, health, and hunger relief. From my experiences, I was coordinating the hunger relief action, uh, such as the community kitchen in the city and in some um, communities where we were going to distribute food and groceries. And in addition to this, with my team, we were able to support um, six families to recover their uh, businesses and homes who are installing the roof of their house and donate um, equipment, tools, and basic supplies to start their business. Sorry. <laughs> And well, um, in the process, I learned the stories of each family um, who faced different challenges after the hurricane, especially the people living in the communities. Um, some families went from one to one to two days without food and without access to drinking weather. Um, a, a story touched my heart and demonstrated um, the resilience of the families to cope with this experience, um, which for many was traumatic. Um, what hurt me the most were the stories the, of the children um, being afraid to die and expressing them in words. I never expected <laughs> to hear sometime, sometime like that from a child and it stirs the soul. And well, these families lost what little they had and what they had built for years. And they lost their home, their, their livelihood, their belongings and relatives. And it's, it's amazing how the city of Acapulco, a very important tourist center in Mexico, is recovering, uh, is recovering very quickly. Uh, however, there are still communities without receiving help or the necessary attention. Um, these tips um, of disaster increase the gap in access to support in the communities and evidence of the in in inequalities that exist in between, between people. And Another thing um, that still surprised me is that Mexico has not learned um, from other events uh, of this magnitude. And we still lack a culture of prevention. Um, the effects of climate change are clear. So the reconstru reconstruction uh, plan for this area should not only include social aid, credits, delivery of household uh, appliances and food supplies, but uh, should also urgently take into account a strategy to prevent and mitigate uh, the effect to effects of climate change. Um, is necessary inform people about the impacts of this disaster and how they are intensified according to the areas where they live. Um, improve urban 
planning and restore natural areas so that they can be natural barriers um improve the habitats of the people and of the tourists that arrive among other action that minimize the impacts that we humans have especially the tourism sector in this area and well <laughs> i'm done thank you very much for the invitation i hope this have given you an overview of what what was experienced in Mexico. Thank you, Carla. Carol. Thanks to Ursula. I know you mentioned some things are still being restored, of course, on the ground, but that's to be expected after a Category 5 hurricane as, as it was for Otis. Um, and it's an ongoing process, but it's also a testament to Acapulco's resilience and um, overall community strength. So thanks for sharing a bit on your organization as well, Operation Blessing to sort of bridge that gap um, and cultural change is of course the hardest part um, of climate change prevention I guess but if anything it may be the silver lining after a disaster like this to you know switch gears into prevention and climate mitigation so thanks Ursula for sharing your experience with us so next we will go to Mr. Christopher Castani aka Raskas he is a Trinidadian environmentalist, musician, and science educator. So let me just add his pin here. Hi, Chris. Um, so his presentation today will shed a spotlight on the historic Maui wildfires in the heart of Lahaina, which was a deadly blaze on August 8th of this year, which also claimed million, uh, dozens of lives. Um, Christopher is a graduate of the UA St. Augustine campus. Um, he has a Bachelor of Science in Petroleum Geoscience. An activist and outspoken environmentalist, he has supported numerous community-based projects and initiatives, including the Rights Action Group, Red Earth Eco Arts Festival, Assembly of Caribbean Peoples, and the National Joint Action Committee, NJAC. Christopher currently teaches chemistry and physics at Kumehameha, Hopefully I pronounced that right, schools, <laughs> which is a, a Hawaiian culture-based education institution. So he's no doubt an all-rounded individual, <laughs> but, um, you know, he's also a skilled pan man, singer-songwriter, parandero, performer <laughs> with the Kalalul Collective, um, <laughs> yeah. which uses music, musics and events to promote social, cultural, and environmental consciousness and action. Um and lastly, he is also a member of the Black Alliance for Peace. So we'll be hearing from Christopher today. I'll pass the floor to you. All right, mahalo, Carly. <laughs> uh, thank you. So yes, I'm out here in Maui, uh, Hawaii. You all can see my screen, yeah? I'm going to switch it over to... Yes, we can. All right, presentation mode. All right, yeah, so I'll get right into it. Um. So we're going to talk about the wildfires that happened on the island of Maui in Hawaii uh, on August 8, 2023. So I'll go over on a brief overview and then look at some of the causes and the context, the aftermath and recovery, and then how climate change plays into this and lessons learned. So to get into it, 2023 on August 8th, we had multiple wildfires on the island of Maui. It was the deadliest wildfires in the U.S. in at least 100 years. There were three locations, but the most severely affected was the historic town of Lahaina, which is in this picture shown here. Um, just to give you an idea of where it is. Actually, sorry, one second. One second, just, just to give you an idea of where it is um, on the globe here. If we zoom in, you still see my screen here? Yes. Okay, so this is the island of Maui. I'll zoom out just slightly so you can see the Hawaiian archipelago. Um, the island of, of the big island of Hawaii is about, about the size of Jamaica, 
Maui is, um, I believe it's smaller than Trinidad. Yeah, it's about half the size of Trinidad, but only 100,000 people. So not a huge population. They have a lot of tourists come through though. So Lahaina is this first location. And then there were two more locations that were a little bit smaller. Um, Hula and Olinda. I live right here in Makawao, so pretty close to, to one of these fires. But Lahaina was where it was really going on. Was why I want to show this too is to give you an idea of the geography, right? So um there, there are two big mountains or big areas of big mountainous regions, and Lahaina is by one of them. Um in fact, so the trade winds come this way, right, from the northeast. And so Lahaina is in the wind shadow. And this is significant for understanding what happened. Um, just to give you an idea of a before and after, real quick. This is an aerial shot. So showing before it was already pretty dry. Maui has been in drought for a few years now. But afterwards, you can see the footprint of the fire it actually started down here and then spread and burnt all of us. Um, all in all, as I will sum it up in a second. Um, well, let me show you a short video. Just, just not going to play the video, just going to look through a little bit um, at some of the scenes. You know, this was from offshore. People actually had to run and jump into the ocean to try to escape this fire. It was moving in some cases at 50 miles an hour. It was jumping across streets in a matter of seconds. Um, it was just crazy. Um, one sentiment that that is interesting, I was shared a lot, like this guy who was a member of the House of Representatives, Kanaka Maoli is what Hawaii, Native Hawaiians call themselves. Um, and he considered it, and a lot of them consider it as um as just the, cul the culmination of and the legacy of colonialism. So I'll get into that in a little bit. But just to sum up, there were 100 people that died, over 12,000 lost their homes, about 2,000 structures burned to the ground. Um, Lahaina was the first capital of the Hawaiian kingdom, so there was a lot of historic sites, a lot of historic heritage that was just lost, just burned down. Cost of damages alone is six billion, not to mention the economic impact because it was also a major tourist um spot. And um the whole tourism sector of the entire island just ground to a halt for months. Um still trying to come back, still barely coming back. And then there's toxic chemicals in the air, soil, groundwater. Um well in the air and soil and as we're getting into the rainy season now, even though it's dry, there's um danger of it getting into the groundwater, into the ocean and the reefs because it's a coastal town. So the causes and context. Um, so we can look at the causes in terms of immediate causes and then more long-term causes or historic causes. And we can look at them as environmental and then also so social or economic or um, cultural, if you want to call it that. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, in terms of environmental factors, the immediate factors will, there has been a, there's been a drought. So there was a lot of dry grass um, that was just there waiting to, to be burned. There, had, there were smaller wildfires in the past couple of years, but there was very strong winds. There was a hurricane, but it was later determined it wasn't actually due to the hurricane, but a high pressure system that caused extremely strong winds, not as strong as a hurricane, but strong enough to to hit down some power lines. Um, and so here's um just a, a map showing you that there was drought already, moderate to severe drought in the area of Lahaina. Um, there were these strong winds that were coming over the mountain. And again, the mountain provides a, a rain shadow. So most of the of the rainfall falls on the windward side of the mountain. And on this side where Lahaina is, is very dry. And then the wind coming down the mountain um, 
was just feeding the flames. At first, it hit down the power lines, and then once once the flames got started, that was just feeding the fanning those flames. Um, and then the flames and the heat from the fire also radiated towards the mountain and kind of reflected as well. So it just kind of was cooking like in an oven. Um, so those are the environmental, the immediate environmental factors, but the uh, immediate infrastructure factors that made it even worse was um, well, the power lines that went down were not de-energized. So that was something that could have been done that could have stopped the fire because they knew that there was a fire risk. They could have turned off the power preemptively. Um, but power lines had been knocked down for about three hours before the fire started and those lines were still live. So that was a failure in terms of um, infrastructure management. There was extremely poor communication, um, co coordination, emergency response. Um, Maui has one of the best emergency response systems in the world for tsunamis and other natural disasters in um, sirens that are tested on the first day of every month. And the sirens were not sounded. So people didn't think that the fire was that um, that dangerous until it was too late. Um, and then when the fire, when the fire officers responded, the fire hydrants were dry or they ran out of water, they lost water pressure very quickly. Um, and then there was poor coordination, traffic congestion. Um, people ended up having to just leave their cars and run to the ocean and jump in. Um, it's amazing that only 100 people died because for a while there were about 3,000 people unaccounted for. Um, but some people had to spend a night in the sea, you know, um, and the flames and smoke was coming at them. But so that those are some of the immediate causes. If you look at some of the long-term causes or historical causes, um, the area that burnt, the dry grass that provided all the fuel for the for the fire was abandoned sugarcane plantations. Um, and this is after about 100 years of monoculture, which is unsustainable, which was profit-driven, planting one crop, or in some places, pineapple, some cases, sugarcane. But after 100 years of that, the soil is depleted. It's not profitable anymore. Um, and so it was abandoned and just left and just grass grew up. But that monoculture, it's, in, it's important to understand that that replaced an uh, indigenous system of stewardship of the land. This stewardship of the land was developed over a couple of centuries. Um, it was connected to the land. It was based on people who were connected to the land. So they took care of the land in a holistic way that provided for collective needs, which had diversity of crops. It had abundance of food but it was not geared towards short-term individual profit. Um, the main crop that was grown in that area was breadfruit, breadfruit trees. And um, and they were actually waterways. It was called the Venice of the Pacific because there was so much water in the area, but now it's dry as a bone, right? So it's interesting to note how changing the land use from indigenous to a capitalist monoculture system um, really created the conditions for this disaster. Um, in terms of infrastructure, the historical um, background is that the place has been developed more for tourists and investors rather than for locals. So there's a big problem with water diversion where only 25% of the water goes to locals, 75% goes to hotels and high-end um, residences that have swimming pools and all this kind of thing when um when the place is in a drought, you know, so there's very little water that act that's actually flowing in the natural waterways, which is exacerbating the dryness of the land. Um the emergency and other services, again, are not they they they're not properly prepared for something like this. Interestingly, the um nepotism, like I said with the siren system, the guy who was in charge. The guy who was the head of the emergency response, he was not even on the island. And when the when when all the information came out, it turns out that he was completely underqualified for the job and got the job because he happened to be the friend of somebody who had some position some years ago. 
and he never actually had to deal with a disaster like this before. So when it came up, he had no idea what to do. And um, that's why the sirens were never activated. Um, and then, this is interesting, the power lines, the power company, the their poles were not maintained. And studies have shown that they knew that the poles needed to be replaced and they didn't do it because it wasn't profitable. In fact, there's this issue of greenwashing, which I'll come back to in a second. Um, I'm going to come back to this idea of greenwashing in a second when I come to climate change. Real quick, just to talk about aftermath, and I'm going to speed up right now. This is what it looked like after. I want to draw your attention to these cars on the road here, again, completely congested. People just had to drive to the ocean and then jump in the ocean. Um, this is liquid metal here. That's how hot the... the, the um, the fire got and a lot of that is probably lead from car batteries so that's very toxic so in the cleanup efforts the full hazmat is required um one of the things about the aftermath kind of similar to the last speaker is that the community really stepped up in fact it took probably a week i think it took days for official emergency response to come in but the community from one side of the island to the other, people were donating, people were using their boats and jet skis to deliver goods. You know, so the community really stepped up in a big way. Um, another thing about the aftermath, though, is that so many people lost their houses. And Hawaii is so tourism based that there are a huge number of houses that are empty right now, which are actually used for short term rentals for tourists actually not poof, not totally legally they don't meet the legal requirements but the legal requir requirements have been waived um over the years to allow the economy to go but uh so the point is there are houses that are available with nobody in them but they're for tourists and so there's a group a lot of people who still have nowhere to to live right now they're living on the beach and they're fishing, they have this uh, movement called Fishing for Housing because as native Hawaiians, they're, part of their rights are uh, they can be allowed to be on the beach 24-7 as long as they're fishing. So they put a, stick a fishing pole in the sand and stay on the beach um, as a way to highlight the need for housing. Um, so that's some of the issues. This is This was August 8th. We are in December. So September, October, November, four months later, and we still have um, thousands of people without a place to live. Um, so the role of climate change. So climate change in Hawaii is affecting it in, in this way. The wetter areas are getting wetter. The wet areas are getting wetter and the dry areas are getting drier. This graph is showing you the percentage change in precipitation. As I said, the wind comes on the comes from the northwest and hits the mountains and drops off the rain there. And those sides are getting 10 to 20 percent more rain. And the other sides are getting 10 to 20 percent less rain. So the dry parts are getting even drier. Um, as with everywhere, temperatures are rising. They're getting more hot days. Um, so with that, the role of climate change, I broke it into Again, short-term and long-term, environmental and then socioeconomic kind of um, environmental. Short-term, these weather conditions, these storms, high winds that are more extreme can cause more frequent and more intense events, which increase the probability of these disasters happening more often. But in the long-term, these divergent microclimates or microclimate shifts, wet, wet getting wetter and dry getting drier, is stressing the biointegrity and creating conditions for more catastrophes. The wet parts get wetter, so you get more intense floods, and the dry parts get drier, so you get more conditions for wildfires. Um, on the socioeconomic part, here's the thing about climate change, the interesting thing about it, greenwashing. Um, the power company, instead of investing in uh repairing the, the light poles that would have prevented the fires they were trying to bid for big money projects for renewable energy projects so they were trying to get big contracts 
to spend huge amounts of money to put down renewable energy projects, which is a good idea. But they did that at the expense of um, the very basic kind of maintenance thing. And so this idea of greenwashing is something we have to watch out for where groups are using climate change as a business opportunity. And this creates a deep skepticism and a loss of trust among the population. And in missing critical needs, it ends up creating more vulnerability. And in the long term, being unprepared can have these huge negative impacts. And I want to point out climate change is only one of a number of multiple social and environmental fronts that are, you know, that are um, threats to society, especially the more vulnerable ones. So um, again, on the idea of greenwashing, the power company knew of the wildfire threat they waited years to act. They were trying to, instead of preventing the power lines from failing, they were trying to invest in, they were trying to um, get investment in their company to, to carry out huge clean energy projects. And I'm all for clean energy, but I mean, here we have another example from another island in, in Hawaii, again, where a big project, hydro, hydro project, hydroelectric dam um, is kind of being fast-tracked without um, consulting the residents. So to wrap up the lessons learned, and I'll be real quick, um, I think a big one here is the, the need to prioritize people over profits in so many ways from the monoculture that created the dry areas and destroyed the indigenous agricultural system that was more sustainable to the tourism, to the power companies, everywhere that profit is put over people is leading to a more and more disastrous outcome. Um, climate change is here. We need to be prepared. Who feels it knows it? And what I mean by this here is that the people on the ground are the ones that really have the solutions. Those are the ones that came together the quickest. Um, and those are the ones that that should always be um, central in any kind of response and even planning. Um, valuing indigenous knowledge kind of speaks for itself, transparency um, and resiliences in the community. So that's pretty much what I have to say. Uh, I don't want to take up too much more time. So mahalo, which is Native Hawaiian for thank you for listening and um, happy to answer any questions at the end. Thanks, Christopher. Um, the imagery is, of course, very difficult. I actually remember seeing it online. Um, you know, people in the water, people just fleeing, you know, people running and seeing that their shoes are burning underneath mm -hmm. their feet and melting. Um, but I also think that the scale of damage and even, you know, possibly the willful ignorance are the most jarring after this presentation. There's also a deeper discussion to be had about how colonialism really adds to the problem, considering how much indigenous practices are just inherently sustainable sustainable by nature. I mean, that's that stewardship is kind of ingrained into indigenous practices, like you said. Um, it also shows just how many factors can play into a natural disaster um, mm -hmm. and a tragedy of this scale. So, you know, it that reflects also that it will be a multi-pronged approach to you know fixing the problem or prevention on a whole um and i know it's only been four months but i hope to see more progress and and of course you know recovery in 2024 um so thanks again christopher for sharing on your side of the world as well um oh, that all, that then brings us to damon white who is on our side of the world here in the Caribbean. Um, but Christopher mentioned in his presentation that droughts was a contributing factor. Um, and Mr. White, or as he prefers to be called Damien, um, kind of brings it full circle because Jamaica experienced a drier than normal season into the spring of 2023. Um, so Mr. Damien White is involved in environmental work for over 22 years. Uh, Damon has a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Biology and a Master in, of Philosophy in Zoology. 
Currently, Damon is also pursuing a PhD in zoology at the University of West Indies Mona campus. Let me see if I can find Mr. White and pin him. Yes, <laughs> perfect. Over the years, Damon has traveled across Jamaica and participated in environmental outreach initiatives to various schools, church groups, and environmental clubs. He frequently shares these outreach initiatives and other advocacy efforts on his social media page called Rooster's World. Committed to safeguarding and conserving endangered animals and the natural environment, Damon serves on several government committees in Jamaica. He is a member of the Scientific Authority, a chairperson for the Endangered Species Working Group of the National Environmental and Planning Agency, a deputy chair for the Invasive Species Advisory Group, and also a member of the Jamaican Iguana Recovery Group. He is also a member of several NGOs, including being a president, being the president of BirdLife Jamaica, uh, Jamaica Institute of Environmental Professionals, Caribbean Coastal Area Management Foundation, and Natural History Society of Jamaica, and also a member of the PMI Jamaica chapter. So I'll pass the floor over to Damien and the droughts in Jamaica this year. Hello, hello, good day. Um, everybody hearing me, right? Yes, we can. Okay. Perfect. All right. Thank you for welcoming me here. Oh, so I start off by saying that Jamaica, the, the meaning of my island name is the land of wood and water. Um, we're about 11,000 kilometers square. It's very, the island is very mountainous, only a fifth of it is flat. And we have about a 120 rivers. We have about 26 watersheds and it feels good to have watershed, but don't let the number fool you because our, our watershed is in problems. So before I get into drought, just let people know that we have two distinct wet seasons in Jamaica, October and May, and our drier months are from January to July. This it was our traditional thing. This was the norm, but all of this have changed. So drought, as we know before mentioned, a deficiency in rainfall. And the beginning of this year, the government said that we had a meteorological drought where a lot of people were wondering, what does that mean? And the meaning of it was that we're going to have well below the normal of rain, of rainfall. So let's look at what happened um, um, over the last 12 months from October 2022 to 23. Every month except June had less rainfall than the previous year. And it was also, we have less, when you look at the 30 year um, average, mean average rain for um, the last 30 years, this year have been one of the lowest. And let me just tell you how hot it gets. Um, July to August, the highest record temperature we have in Jamaica was in 2019, where it was 39.1. And we had temperatures reaching up there this year. And we have 50 to 20 heat wave days to the end of August, where people were burning. Now look at the impact. So I just draw one of our watershed, which is a Coptic country, where some of you guys might hear um, different environmentalists talking about this area, which in biodiversity. And it is said to produce 40% of the island's um, drinking water. However, development and cutting down the trees and all of that, and when people go and cut down the forest, and stuff like grass um, returns to the area. During the dry season, the grass um, dries up and it becomes fire hazard in our watersheds. We don't know what the impact is having on our biodiversity. And it, totally, we had members like from the bird group telling us that they had to provide water for some of our birds and some of the animals. We have endemic species here that are very dependent on humidity and rainfall. And we need more studies to know what the impact of this drought had on them. Now, one of the things that we find out that happening, so we're, our elevation moved from zero to uh, approximately, um, I'm trying to remember if it's 4,000, no, 4,200 meters. So the elevation changes. And what normally used to occur is that with elevation, um, there is a temperature change and stuff like mosquitoes couldn't be found in certain elevation. Now when the place get dry, as a result of climate change, we have a shift of invasive moving up and invasive like the mosquito, ages is a child, where we know a uh, number of the Caribbean islands having dengue. So one of the things that occurred um, 
with the, the drought period was that some place get hotter, the mosquitoes moved up. And another thing that happened is because people were storing a lot of water, you know, they didn't have much portable water, so they're using tanks, so they provided breeding sites for the mosquitoes. And we also have new introduced species like the introduced um, Cuban tree frog, which are breeding in some of these stored air, and we don't know what the impact it's having on the water quality. Now, what the drought did, it disrupt our normal quality of life. So in Jamaica, you know, tourism is one thing. We like to go to the beach. I have a friend right there at the bath at the springs, getting her mud bath before she goes in the hot springs. We have in rural areas where people still use water to bathe, to wash their plates, and to wash their clothes. And we also have a number of stakeholders that get, uh, this here is what we call busu in Jamaica. It is a freshwater snail. Um, that the people catch in the river. We have here freshwater shrimp and fish. All of this were affected in the drought series because the water level dropped. So it affected people's livelihoods. It affected um, daily activities. Now here is interesting, I'm sure you know, we had this river on the Somerset Falls to your left. It was a beautiful waterfall during the drought period. There was no water. So people couldn't go in it and bathe and we couldn't have some of the other recreational activities. Now, this has become the new norm. I live in Kingston, and in some areas, this is the new norm. In my apartment, we did not have tanks because we normally get from the portable water. But this year, we had water restrictions that they will tell you that you will get water from 6 p.m. to about 4 p.m., and then the other people will get from 4 p.m. to 6 a.m. But most of the time, the water company did not keep the time regulation, water come and go. So you had to change your lifestyle to fit it. So because of that, you had to get used to bathing in that bucket. Some people who can't afford it got tanks and some people use these drums. Now, one of the things that I want to bring out, when we think about climate change, sometimes we forget about the rural people. Now, portable water is not access to some rural people here. And this tank that you see in the video here, the people are totally dependent on this and tanks like this. So what the farmer does is um they use that water to give to their crop and they also just drink from it and you find insects and stuff living in it. And during the drought period when the water level gets very low, then you got algae and all sorts of other organisms growing in it, which becomes a problem in terms of water quality. We also had like animals, farm animals, because it was so hot as a result of the drought limitation of water and got so hot still they start falling down. So farmers now have to be giving them ice to keep them cool. Now what happened during the drought is, is that you spend so much money in terms of insecticide and pesticide to, to grow the crops. And the pests are out there. So what happened is the farmers use these pesticide and some of these pesticides, they, they spray like the cabbage every week. Some of it is every three days. So you can imagine what is the impact it will be having on the people who consume it, or even the farmers who are spraying these things for like every three days until the crop is ready. We also have here that we call ticks. When the, the time gets very dry on the drought, this is a um, what they call tick season in Jamaica, and it lasts much longer. And what the farmers are doing is using um, insecticides that are not supposed to be get on humans to spray because they can't afford to buy the normal insecticide like off and you know it. Now, I'm showing you, this is a video that was, that was done in one of the rural areas. And this guy planted a field of um, potato. All of the potato died. Everything died because of the drought conditions. Move on. So no, this, we had an increase in forest fires. And this is an area in Upper St. Andrew called Jacks Hill, which is pretty near to Kingston. And what happened yearly is that during the dry season, the, um, the hill catch a fire. And one of the things that we noted notice is that because people have removed the natural vegetation, a lot of invasive like grass, acacia, are the vegetation on these hills. When the rain falls, the place looks green and that. However, during the dry season, it dries up and it's the perfect 
or I should say perfect for fires. So we have to find out we have putting back the native plants. Now, when we look at our water infrastructure, I got this information from the prime minister who said most of our infrastructure in Kingston, which is the city that I lived in, are more than 40 years old. We have two reservoirs. One is the Hermitage Dam, which is, which is about 80 years old, and the Mona Reservoir, which is 1940. Now, during the drought, these reservoirs weren't re receiving any water. So some people are saying build more reservoir, but if you don't have proper watersheds, if you are developing the watershed, if you are cutting down the trees, then you won't have enough water coming to these water storage. And one thing in Jamaica is that everybody wants to find a, a solution for the drought during the drought season, but as soon as the rain comes, everybody forgets about it. Now, to summarize all what I've said, is that we have a lot of work to do. And this drought season that we had this year has been pretty bad because no people's eyes are open because when it normally affects the rural people, some people are like, okay, it doesn't affect me. No, it's affecting them. And they see now that we have to find long-term solutions in terms of water storage, in terms of what we do with water collection, in terms of what we do with watershed, in what we do to help vulnerable people, because a lot of people's lifestyle were affected by the drought. Um, these are my reference list. And I would like to say thank you guys. Um, I'm always on social media and I'm happy to meet my Caribbean family. Thank you. Thanks, Damien. Um, let me see if I could just unpin you quickly. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, yeah, thanks, Damon. Um, it's raining right now, actually, here in Belize, which is out of season for us as well. But it just goes to show that traditional rainy seasons are shifting every year and we are living in a changing climate. Um, there's a phrase I find haunting, but it's true that this summer may be the hottest you've ever experienced, but it's also the coolest you'll ever experience. So it just spots light uh, the power and vulnerability of watersheds and the ripple effects that it could have on us. Um, so thanks, Damon, for sharing some of the challenges and realities of droughts in Jamaica. Uh, that is all three presenters. So we'll now open the floor for anyone who may have any questions or comments or feedbacks. You could leave it in the chat and I'll present on your behalf. Or you can just uh, raise your hand here on Zoom. There's a feature um, and we'll also share the screen with you as well. So if there's anyone that may have any questions, just let me know. Hi. Um, oh, sorry, should have put my hand up. No, that's fine. You can just unmute yourself. Yeah. Um, I, I just noticed what was striking, at least in the first two presentations, was that, um, first of all, community, community efforts, communities came together um, in, after a major disaster. Um, it's a little different with Jamaica because the drought is like a, an ongoing, uh, ongoing disaster in a way. So it's not a sort of like a big event, although it is in a way. But I noticed that, you know, community um, resilience is very important. And I also noticed that there is an, a, a strong element of like inequalities in the societies that it affected. And uh, Ursula picked up on that as well in her wonderful humanitarian work that she has been doing. Um, but she, you know, she's fully aware of it as well. And, and obviously in Hawaii and in Jamaica to some extent with tourism, the dominance of tourism, that kind of equal inequality comes out too. So I found those two points um, very interesting. Um, I, I'd like to ask Damien, do you think more um, community effort could be made in, in, in Jamaica or are people too dependent on the government to come up with all their solutions? Well, there, there is a lot of communities and a rural 
communities have been surviving without government help. They have to find a way to survive. And if you find out when we, when we are doing a, a number of community projects, a lot of energy are normally put in urban areas and people always forget the rural people. But when you go down to the rural, they have come up with initiative to solve their problems. They are the ones who go out there and build the tanks. They are the ones who might be using certain insecticides who might not agree with it, but they have a solution to start out their way of life. But I'm not saying it's right. But they, they, they have to work with what they have. But a, num a number of the communities that are visiting, they are doing what they can do. But I think we, I think some of the technocrats are not visiting these areas. They make decisions and they're not going out and understanding um, some of the, the challenges that these community members face and what they have to do. I can give an example when I spoke about the grass lice to government officials. Ask what that. But any farmer that you talk to during the drought season, you if you have animals, you're going to have that. And they can't buy offspring what we can buy because an uh, offspring that's an off that would be like 2,500 Jamaica, which would be about 10, 10 US. And they're struggling to find insects and food to buy. They won't. So we need to come up with some solutions. I mean, the experts are, the community members are doing their thing, but they need help. Okay, thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Emma and Damien. Um, like Emma mentioned, there's definitely a lot of parallels. Um, I know we just covered the Americas, but we had someone from Mexico, you know, um, a training in Hawaii and of course Jamaica. But there is it, it just goes to show that we are disproportionately affected um, even as developing nations. Um, and it, it even though we're, we may not all be small island states, there's a lot of parallels and similarities that we could learn from each other. So I'm going to also ask Christine to unmute. I know she's raised her hand. So, Christine, if you wanted to take over and ask your question, now go ahead. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone. Thanks for hosting this event as well. I think it's so necessary. Um, first, I'm Christine Samaru. I'm based in Guyana, and I run an organization called the Breadfruit Collective. So when I heard about the breadfruit trees in Hawaii, you know, I felt very sad. Um, but my first question is, how is everyone doing? Because you're at the forefront of these issues. and we have heard about them, but because of everything else that's happening in the world right now, it's kind of like they've fallen off our horizon because there's so much news um, that's ongoing. We had the COP, we have everything that's playing out in the Middle East. There's so, so much. So um, my second question would be in terms of Hawaii and Mexico, um, what is the support like? Are you receiving any support or attention? Because we've seen the widespread impact, especially of the wildfire in, in Hawaii. But um, as it is now within the last month, I've heard nothing at all. So what is what does um, development or redevelopment look like now? Ursula, I don't know if you'd like to go first. If not, maybe Christopher. Yes, thanks. I don't mind going. Um, yes, what is support like now? I mean, Hawaii is, for better or worse, is currently part of the U.S. So I guess residents get some support from the U.S. I would say that it took it it felt like it took them a long time to respond and then the president biden came over and he gave some speech where he kind of forget where he was and all of this kind of thing because he going senile so after that i don't know um they 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 offer people some money um people are getting some support they are getting some support but the the main thing is right now housing and the economy 
because the economy is so dependent on tourism, I, I, and, and because of the inequality, as the last person mentioned, there's a resentment from a lot of the locals, especially Native Hawaiians, towards the tourism sector. So there was a backlash immediately after where people were saying, don't come to Hawaii, don't come to Maui. So tourism completely fell off a cliff, you know, it stopped totally. And now it's it's coming back slowly, but a lot of tourists still don't want to come back because they want to be respectful. But then we had a, a whole other set of people, a lot of the island, including my family, um, where I don't, I was not directly affected. I had friends affected who lost their home, but I didn't lose my home. But then I lost significant income because the economy is so dependent on tourism. Um, and it's very expensive to live here. So I'm a high school teacher, but I also have to do other things on the side. And my wife works and all of this. And most of it is connected in some way or the other to tourism. So um, so we had a whole bunch of people got laid off, you know, because they because hotels weren't getting as much tourists. Um so, but there are people that are helping out. I think the community really came together and, you know, people are making do. A lot of people had to leave the island. That's that's the honest truth. A lot of people have left the island. Um, I have a, a Guyanese sister out there, uh, a lady out there who has a, a, a Caribbean food truck. She's from Guyana. She had to close down her food truck. She completely lost her business and she had to, she had to move, you know. So that kind of thing is happening to a lot of people. Those who lost who lost their homes, um, those who had insurance, it's slowly coming back. But you had a lot of people who were renting, and so they lost a lot of things, and they may not have had insurance, and they still don't have a place to live. So you're right that there's a lot going on, and it kind of, um, it, 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 it has gone off the news cycle, but it's still there, and it's going to be a few years, you know. Um, so that's how it is over here. It's, it's still there. It's coming back slowly. But we have a lot of people still looking for homes. That's the main thing right now, homes. Thanks, Christopher. Um, Ursula, I don't know if perhaps you'd like to share as well. Um, Christine was just asking about, uh, you know, the impacts and recovery now on the ground. So... Yes, um, sorry, my my friend Esteban um, helped me translate now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, actualmente en México no, no sé bien si se ha recibido apoyo de parte de la Convención de Cambio Climático, pero sí muchas organizaciones que nos encontramos en atención al desastre, al huracán, bueno, al impacto que tuvo el huracán Otis, sí, sí tienen eh, donaciones o recursos por parte de cooperación internacional desde diferentes enfoques. Eh, Hago una pausa para... Uh -huh. Ok, so in México... Uh, I don't know if uh, we have received some uh, support from international aid, such as the Climate Change Convention, uh, but I know that the NGOs working here uh, have received some funding from private sources uh, to bring some, some support to the people here. Y bueno, otras organizaciones también están recaudando fondos a partir de donaciones de, de personas. And other NGOs also are doing crowdfunding and uh, calling for donations from the people. Y el gobierno eh, invertirá eh, mucho dinero en la recuperación del turismo del sector turístico para activar la economía. Also the government uh, is about to invest a, a huge amount of money to recover the tourism activities and restore the economy. Como una estrategia de adaptación. Um, sin embargo, eh, hace falta tener 
un plan estratégico más integral, donde se incluya no solo el sector turístico, sino también, o más bien donde se cambie eh, la manera de desarrollar el turismo en estas áreas, en donde tomen en cuenta los demás sectores, eh, incluyendo también el, a las comunidades que dependen también de este sector, perdón. These actions are part of uh, uh, adaptation strategies uh, from the government, but there is still an, uh, a need of implementation of an strategic plan that includes the communities, um, the, the needs of the people uh, in, the, in the planning of, of these tourism activities and have more integral policies From Gracias. Um, Thanks, uh, Ursula. Mm -hmm. um, I think there was one more person that may have had their hand up. I don't know if I missed you. Um, but if there's anyone else who would like to add any questions, we could probably take one more. Yes, no. If not, then I'll pass it over to Tyrell Gittens, which you may know already. Um, but Tyrell is the project coordinator here at the, an editor, sorry, at the Caribou Environmental News Network. Tyrell, I think your audio is a bit warped. Well, let's see if it carps up. Yeah, that's fine. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'll keep it brief because I know we had a very um informative but we know it's a lot of information i want to thank you so much as our ceo mr omar but uh mohammed what i've said earlier on in the webinar for just supporting the two series this year both the state of the environment and the climate breakdown you know we have really envisioned these webinars to be a platform to facilitate these conversations and really understand how environmental issues affect us on the ground level, but also, you know, give us the opportunity to think about how we can do more and be part of the solutions, be it um, be actors of change in our communities at a national level, at a regional level, or even a global level, if, you know, we find platforms um, to operate there. So 2023 has taught, us, has taught us a lot of lessons in regard to climate change and environmental issues, and we hope to continue these conversations next year, both through the webinars as well as our articles. Um, so I would uh, encourage everyone to follow us on our social media platforms. I'll put those information um, where you could connect with us in the chat as well as in the um, email following the webinar when we distribute um, the resources. And thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm wishing you on behalf of the Copper Foundation team a happy holidays. And we hope to see you in the new year to, you know, again, continue these conversations and build on the solutions. So, Carly, I'm turning it back to you. <laughs> Thanks, Errol. Um, Just to close off quickly, I wanted to say, you know, all three presenters today shared their individual natural disasters um, experiences here in the Americas. But it's really the hours and days and, and months and years to follow that can really lead to policies and practices to reduce our collective vulnerability. Um, and I really think that discussions and reviews like the ones we've done here today can translate into measurable actions and, you know, better preparedness for hopefully not so intense down the line. But um, on behalf of the Cropper Foundation and, of course, the Environmental News Network, I would also like to thank everyone for joining us today, especially our presenters who did great jobs, Ursula, Damon, and Christopher. Um, we really appreciate you all. And uh, let's just keep the conversation going, everybody. So happy holidays as well. Um, I think this was a great discussion to close out 2023. And we look forward to posting you all again in 2024. Goodbye from Jamaica. Bye. Thanks, Damien. <laughs> no problem. Bye, everyone.
Bye, Charola. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. All the best Thanks, to you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. All right.